Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome everybody to this interview with a psychologist. My name is Dr. Ben Bullock and today I'm talking to Professor Greg Murray. Uh, Professor Murray is a senior psychologist uh, here at Swinburne. In fact, he's a professor here at Swinburne University. Uh, he's also a, a psychologist uh, who treats uh, clients. Uh, and he's also the uh, editor of a book called A Critical Introduction to DSM. So there's probably no one better to speak to about the issues surrounding uh, diagnosis of psychological disorders. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Ben. Um, so in your opinion, what role does diagnosis play in psychotherapy? Yeah, so th that's a really important first question. I think when we're trying to characterise a client, you know, to, to describe them, we call that a case formulation. And in psychology, a case formulation is a sort of strengths-oriented description of their problems that then informs or provides a map for treatment. So that's the case formulation. In my opinion, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, diagnosis may form part of the case formulation. So for example, I might have a client who's got a bunch of anxiety and mood problems, but it's probably worth my while working out whether the pattern of problems they have match up with one of the recognised diagnoses. And the reason I think that's worthwhile is if the, the pattern of problems they have do happen to match up with one of the diagnoses, then that diagnosis brings with it a whole lot of information, prognostic information, treatment information. And it also enables me to communicate with other people about my client. So if there's a match between the symptoms or the presenting issues and a diagnosis, it's worth finding out. But it's also important to keep in mind that the diagnosis doesn't trump the case formulation. It's a part of the case formulation. So, for example, I have some clients, uh, my specialisation clinically is bipolar disorder. And some of my clients who warrant a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, the diagnosis is really the majority of the case formulation. That is, their problems and issues are pretty much summarised by that term. But I've got other clients who warrant a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, and the diagnosis is a very small part of the overall case formulation. So that's where I see it all sort of fitting together. OK, thank you. OK, so Greg, can you explain to us what DSM is? I've heard people call it the Bible of Psychiatric Disorder. Yeah. So DSM stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And the first thing to point out is that word statistical in the title is not how we psychologists normally think about it. There's nothing statistical in the psychological sense about the manual. It's, that term just refers to the fact that uh, the manual was first developed to literally be part of sort of epidemiological studies of the prevalence of problems. And so each diagnosis has a number next to it. So it's a very different use of the word statistical yep. than we would normally think of in psychology. Um, and so the, the DSM is one of two major descriptive schemes for mental disorders, the other being the World Health Organization descriptive scheme, which is called ICD. Um, but focusing particularly on DSM, it's a very interesting book and a very contentious book. It's now up to its fifth edition. The fifth edition came out last year. And I think it's useful to, when we're talking about it, to remember where it comes from and what it's designed to do. So the DSM is written by the American Psychiatric Association. The American Psychiatric Association has something like 33,000 members and, and like the Australian Psychological Society, it's a professional guild. That's what they exist for. And one of their major tasks is to write a descriptive uh, sort of classification of all the mental disorders, but primarily for the use of their members. So if, if we keep in mind who writes it and who it's written for, it helps us to understand some characteristics of the book. So for example, the book has to contain in it every presenting problem that a practicing American psychiatrist might meet. So it errs on the side of over-inclusiveness, and this is something that it's criticised for, right? So everything, you know, little, little disorders that maybe only six people have noticed or syndromes that ten people have presented at a conference, they'll probably get into the book. They set the bar low for entry into the book because of this pragmatic reason that their members need a book that allows them to describe everything they do. So that's the first thing to notice. But the other thing to notice, of course, is 
It's written by a psychiatric organisation, which is a sub-discipline of medicine, yeah. and therefore, as a descriptive scheme for mental disorders, it uses very medical language, hence words like diagnosis, symptom, uh, differential diagnoses, and all those words bring with them some connotations about the nature of mental disorders. And uh, that's one of the points where DSM starts to get itself into a bit of trouble. Can I say a bit more about that? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So, for example, all the diagnoses in DSM are categorical. That is, you either warrant the diagnosis or you don't. There's no sense of things being on a continuum. So depression, for example, many of us might think that uh, diagnosable depression is just an extreme form of normal sadness or down in the dumpsness. There's no real way to communicate that with DSM. In DSM, if you meet the criteria, tick, you get the diagnosis. And more and more people are thinking, well, that's probably not how most mental disorders actually are. Another way to say that is, is uh, there are some mental disorders that are very categorical. I'll give you the classic example is Huntington's disease. Mm. Huntington's disease is a condition where uh, neural pathways get destroyed in the brain. We get all sorts of psychological symptoms. It's due to a particular gene and its action uh, through uh, neural pathways. And the question is, to what extent are most mental disorders like that? And the answer is, they're not. Most mental disorders are not like that. Even archetypal mental disorders, like uh, the diagnosis of schizophrenia or major depressive disorder, they just aren't like that in fundamental ways. So there is a well-recognised validity problem that comes with this medical approach to describing mental disorders. And I, I must say, this is, this is a well-recognised problem by the authors of the book itself. Mm. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. So if there are problems with the medical model of mental disorder, uh, what are the alternatives? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story about yep. this. So in the middle of 2013, when DSM-5 was released, yep. this very interesting thing happened. Um, so the, the other major organisation in the United States that, are, that is associated with mental health is the National Institutes of Mental Health, the big research organisation. And the boss of that organisation, a guy called Thomas Insel, wrote on his blog on the week that DSM-5 was released. He said, congratulations, guys, you've done a fantastic job, another great DSM. By the way, we won't be using it. <laughs> he said, the well-known problems of validity of that system mean we are not happy funding research into those diagnoses. And as I say, the DSM itself recognises those problems with validity. And the National Institutes of Mental Health put forward an alternative descriptive scheme for mental disorders. And it's much more like the sorts of ways of thinking that psychologists would use. It's a more dimensional descriptive scheme where there are a small number of uh, what they call sort of basic processes, right. which, which they think apply to everybody. So for example, one of them is called positive affectivity. Right? So, you know, I might be a fairly happy sort of person, but maybe if I have some extreme version of that quality, maybe I'm prone to mania. That's the sort of model right. that the NIMH is introducing. So, yes, there are very serious explorations of alternatives to DSM, and many of those have actually been driven through the DSM process. Again, I want to underline that the people who are involved in that process are not the bad guys here. They've actually been a sort of lightning rod for sceptical discussion of diagnoses. And most of what we uh, know about psychopathology has actually been aided by DSM and that project of trying to describe these things. But yes, there are alternatives. Okay, good. I've heard that DSM has been influenced by pharmaceutical companies. What do you have to say about that accusation? Yeah. There, it's a very contentious document, a and this in particular is a really interesting point because it gives me the chance to explain something else about DSM. I need to take a step back. So DSM is this descriptive classification manual in the domain of mental disorders or, or what we call the science of psychopathology. The science of psychopathology is the study of the nature and treatment of mental disorders. 
Now, so DSM is meant to be the classification scheme yep. that you know applies to that area. Now, the problem with that area is we know bugger all about it. <laughs> um, someone once very cleverly said a couple of years ago, they said um, sci the science of psychopathology. He said it reminds me of biology before Darwin. Right. <laughs> We really don't know yeah, much. Yeah. And, and when I talk to students about this, I point out that, well, you know, if you're trying to work out how much do we know about something, one way to work that out is how powerful are, are our interventions. Mm. And the reality is, if, if, you, if you know anyone who's been ever dealt with serious problems of mental disorder, you know our interventions are not that good. Mm. Mm. And they're suspicious in that the same intervention applies to lots of different problems and very different looking interventions have the same effect on one problem. So it's all of it doesn't look like we know much, right? And so that's the context in which DSM does its work. The facts just aren't there, right? It's not as if there are very clear-cut facts to help us distinguish bipolar disorder from schizophrenia or whether hearing voices should be its own diagnosis or, you know, all those fundamental questions of de about description the data just isn't there so naturally the process of writing a book like DSM is a very social negotiated process right. it's not as if we can just go to the psychopathology textbook and get the data and write the manual from the data it's just not there so it's very as I say, social, it's negotiated, it's discussed. And that opens the process. It's, it's, people are a bit shocked, I think, when they realise that there isn't much science or the lack of science underpinning many of those decisions. And in any situation where the science is strong or is not strong or the data doesn't speak for itself, then social processes will start to have, have an impact. That's unavoidable. And the two major processes that people are concerned about with DSM as having an impact are commercial interests, like large pharmaceutical companies, and cultural things. So the, the example of culture that's often referred to is um, homosexuality's appearance and then disappearance mm. Mm. from DSM. So there's a well-known story about it being there as a mental disorder, and then it was moved to it's only a mental disorder if it ca causes you distress, and now it's not there at all, which directly, of course, parallels cultural movements in how we think of about course. homosexuality. Now, with the pharmaceutical thing, again, I would say it's kind of unavoidable. Mm. The pharmaceutical industry is a major player, probably the major funder, of psychopathology research worldwide. Mm. So there is no way to keep them out. What the DSM process has tried to do is uh, now in DSM-5 they went through a lot of hoops to try and minimise the possible appearance of a conflict of interest between people on the panels and connections to pharmaceutical companies. But because pharmaceutical companies are ab absolutely intrinsic to the whole science of psychopathology, that will always be uh, an issue. Mm. They will always have, until they stop taking interest in medications for mental disorders, mm. which some of them are currently doing, they will always have an undue influence on the process. It's unavoidable. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Thanks. Okay, uh, so what other limitations are there to DSM? So the obvious one is, remember we said before it's, it's important to remember it's a medical text. So it's sort of a no-brainer. DSM is not going to be very good at describing those features of humans that are their strengths and qualities. So the whole positive psychology movement uh, has put a lot of effort into describing, you know, resilience factors, coping mechanisms, all those things that are so important about human functioning that we as psychologists, when we're working with clients, actually emphasise because that's... Um, one of our major points of leverage of is course. by finding out people's qualities and taking advantage of them. Mm. DSM is pretty much silent on mm. that whole thing, mm. not surprisingly, given, given where, it, where it comes from. Yeah. Okay. So, finally, Greg, uh, what advice would you give psychologists about using this, or diagnosis in particular, but using DSM as well? Yep. My advice is actually very close to uh, the instructions in the manual itself. Uh, which most people don't read. So a lot of the really unproductive consequences of making diagnoses and using DSM diagnoses in particular are because of the way people use diagnoses, not that they've used 
diagnosis. Right. So you can use diagnoses in very unsophisticated and in fact destructive ways. You, you need to be aware whenever you think about a diagnosis that diagnoses in our culture are laden with stigma and you need to think about how you're going to manage that. You also need to think about, and this goes back to that, that first question we were talking about, the limited validity of the diagnoses. So you really can't um, treat the diagnoses as if they uh, refer to real things. In fact, the, the authors of DSM have been pulling their hair out about this for like two or three decades. It's called the problem of reification, treating these concepts as if they're things. They're useful concepts. It's a very useful language, and here at Swinburne, when we teach people clinical psychology, it's a fundamental part of the training because the, the language, the terms contained in DSM, are uh, associated with a huge amount of information and, of course, sceptical discussion. But if you make the mistake of treating these terms as if they're real things, then you are buying into not only an approach to diagnosis that DSM itself says is not appropriate, but you're also buying into the very unproductive, potentially stigmatising, disempowering, and I would argue invalid way of describing people. So there are, there are real benefits and risks to right. using DSM. And uh, this is why the manual itself says this manual should only be used by people with proper training in psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, so they understand what the terms mean and what they don't mean. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Greg. I uh, really appreciate your time today. Um, I think we've got some really interesting insight, uh, some uh, critical uh, evaluation of DSM. Uh, and this is a, a obviously a, a very... Um, uh, important and, and crucial area to being a psychologist. One of the things you do is diagnosis. So it's really, it's great to get that sort of uh, insight from someone who's actually heavily involved in, um, in, in, in that area of psychology. So thank you very much. It's been fun. Cool. This has been a Swinburne production. 